Band Weekly is live and on the air right now. Should we do it? Let's do it. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Whoa. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Garage Band Weekly. Happy Halloween to those in the US, Canada, UK, Europe, all the places that are in the past. If you're here in the future, it is the 1st of November. So we are in a brand new month that we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on around here, not only on this show, but for the entire month of November here on Studio Live today. So strap yourself in and uh, get ready to rock and roll. Now, if you've got a question... All you need to do is put the word question, just do exactly that thing, put the word question in front of your comment here in the chat, and I will circle around. We have a QA and a section coming up, so I'll check back in with that after we get into the news and notes for the last week. Let's, uh, let's jump in and uh, talk about what's been going on in the world of GarageBand, and you know what, the world of music in general. And number one, uh, I just wanted to shout out that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame celebrations happened yesterday, uh, or last night, or whenever it was. It was like a Halloween thing, or a day ago. Um, yeah, and the Foo Fighters were inducted. So yeah, our man Dave Grohl is now in twice. Now, what does that have to do with Garage Band? Not a whole lot, except for the fact that uh, the Foo Fighters, and Dave Grohl in particular, when uh, he, he started the Foo Fighters after Nirvana broke up, and of course they broke up uh, after the untimely passing of Kurt Cobain, and uh, he created the album, the very first Foo Fighters album, in his own, like in a home studio, not a home studio, but in like his friend's recording studio. He wrote all the, the songs, he played all the instruments himself, and he produced this album. And I remember when, the first time I heard that story, the first time I listened to the Foo Fighters' first album, I thought to myself... Oh yeah, that's that's something you can do now. I was here sitting thinking, I don't have a band, so I can't record songs. I can't make an album or I can't make a single because I don't have a band. And that kind of ignited something inside me that went, wait a minute, you don't need a band. You don't need to necessarily have other people around you. You can actually do it all yourself. Now, should you always do it all yourself? No, but you can. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if Dave Grohl 20 years ago when he went, when all that went down, had thought in 25 years, in fact, <laughs> had thought, oh yeah, in the future, people are going to be able to do all of these things without anything. Like they're going to be able to pick up their phone and they're going to have as much power in GarageBand on their iPhone as uh, I have in a fully fledged, you know, $100,000, $200,000 recording studio. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to call that out to say congratulations. And, and to see Dave Grohl and uh, Paul McCartney singing Get Back live on stage, I mean, come on now. I know that everyone apart from our friend Russ, uh, who's not a Beatles fan, would have been digging on that. All right, let's get into some actual garage band and uh, relatable stuff here. So the uh, one thing that has been happening, so we had the Apple announcement uh, about two weeks ago. The MacBook Pro, the brand new ones, are now out and about. They're in the wild. Uh, if you want to uh, check out a review of one, I recommend our friend Rene Ritchie. So if you jump over here, yeah, you can uh, you can take a look. He, he does all the shiny and uh, delicious things with you know spinning MacBooks and talking about all the things and all the stats and all the, the, the nerdy stuff that you want and, and as you saw just flash up on there yeah all of that it, all the good stuff is in there and it is a, a very nice unit the new macbook pro not cheap not for the faint of wallet <laughs> so it is if you're a garage band creator do you need the souped up m1 max latest edition uh, macbook pro maybe not but if you if money is no object go buy one because they're awesome and uh, if if you do want to make sure that you're future proof let's here's the thing the thing with apple products is that for for all the all the crap crap that they get about not lasting or not being supported you can still use the latest version of iOS on an iPhone 6S from like seven, eight years ago. And it's the same with Mac. Like if you've got a MacBook from like 2015 or 2014, it's going to be running the latest versions of things. Yeah, when you get back to 2013 and earlier, it's a little bit trickier. But if you are looking to buy, if you want a laptop right now that is going to last you throughout the years then this is actually a pretty good deal. Because again, I know you're like, oh, but it's $3,000, $4,000, $5,000. But how much productivity are you going to get in the next seven or eight years using that? So if you got yourself a beefed up MacBook Pro, it's probably going to last you all that time. If you went down a little bit and got something like the MacBook Air, yeah, you're probably going to get be absolutely fine in GarageBand right now. But in three or four years time, you might look back and go, oh, if I spent that extra $1,000 there, what would I have now? And I'd have an extra five years of longevity. So that's always the thing. I, I used to be a person that was like, just get what you need. And look, I still am. Use what you have right now to create music. 
absolutely. But sometimes it does help you to future proof. And I've, I've learned this over the time in that in the past where I've bought the Sonique brand TVs and all the, the really dodgy brands that you get at here in Australia, like JB Hi-Fi or Good Guys or whatever your big box store equivalent is, it wasn't until I switched up and started buying Panasonic and Samsung and Sony things that I realized just how crappy and how short-lived a lot of that disposable tech is. So when you're considering all these things, think about that. Think about the longevity and look at what the end game is going to be. Um, one of my customers just ordered the new MacBook, uh, not the Pro, and it was still $4,300. Yeah, uh, and it, it can be. So the MacBook uh, the MacBook Air, you can, and, and we'll do this. So one of the things we're going to look at, you would have seen the title, is around these MacBook Pros. So we're going to dive in in the, in the rant in a moment. We're going to dive in and talk about which Mac should you choose right now? What, what are the considerations? So I thought, because I'm going through this right now, I'll share my learnings and I'll share what I'm considering with all of you as well. Uh, the other thing that we've got is the AirPods 3. So again, uh, I, I point you towards our man, Rene Ritchie, because even though some people say, oh, Rene Ritchie's such an Apple fanboy, he's actually not, uh, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Uh, I think he gives the most balanced and the most in-depth reviews, uh, and he just knows what he's talking about. So if you're not aware, there he is comparing the AirPods Pro with the new AirPods third generation. They're kind of similar. They've got a lot of the same sort of features, but they don't have the little silicon tips. So uh, if you're like me, I like the AirPods Pro and I like I like earphones that actually have a silicon tip at the end because my ears are like a weird shape and the ones that are just the, the normal plastic, they tend to fall out. So that's kind of why I'm probably not picking up a pair, but they do have a lot of the cool features that uh, a lot of the others don't. I'll just pause on this so that I can steal Renee's content here of all the things. So you're getting the spatial audio, you're getting the adaptive EQ, you're getting all the sweat and water resistant. You've got better, better quality um, case as well. You've got the nice sort of metal latching case, four sensor controls, so you can do the click, 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 and it moves around. So there's a lot going on there, and they, they're still like a $150 pair of headphones. So don't get me wrong, I'm not here saying, go out, everyone must go out and buy a $4,000 MacBook Pro and $150 headphones. No, you don't, you know. I, in my pocket, I always carry a pair of these. These are $20 headphones with a $10 lightning dongle on the end, and these are my go-tos for everything. These are the JBL Endurance Run, and they are a very, very good quality for the buck. These are about 20 bucks to buy in the US, about $30 here in Australia. Uh, they're a nice fit, so they've got this sort of ear hole shaped thing here. They've got multiple silicon tips that you can put in there. They go in and uh, the microphone on here, if you've ever seen me recording video out, I do have an actual lightning microphone, but more often than not, you'll see these in my ears and I'm usually just lazy and using this mic because it is actually pretty good. It punches well above its weight. So if you do want to check those out, there is one place that you can go. You can jump on over to my studio gear guide, which is at studiolivetoday.com slash gear. Here it is. And if you scroll on down, that's all my studio gear, my mobile setup for my studio and my desktop set up and down here in the master list you'll find absolutely everything including uh down below if we keep going down here to headphones do, 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 do. headphones there they are the jbl endurance run and we'll jump over are they in stock on amazon right now they are oh my goodness they're 18.99 like i don't say this about a lot of things don't go and spend four thousand dollars without thinking i'm buying a macbook but if you want a pair of reliable all round, just work just sound good headphones Go and grab some of these right now. JBL Endurance Run. They've got the remote with the microphone and the button. They've got the really nice silicon tips there. TRRS, which means they'll plug into any of your mobile and smart devices. And you really just can't go wrong. And look, you'll get them. You'll get them by... Oh, hang on. Oh, that's for me. <laughs> I'm like, by Wednesday, November 24, that's to ship them to Australia. I'm sure if you're in another part of the world, you'll get them a lot quicker. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's see. I uh, did see some comments coming in here from some, some folks. So uh, Jeline says, in my personal opinion, I think Apple products are not just expensive because of the hardware being top notch, but because of the influence of the Apple brand itself on the computer industry. Uh, yeah, and you're definitely paying for the brand name. Uh, it, it is true. You, you do pay for that. And I, for, for those folks that, that talk to me, and I do very occasionally, because I think hopefully I'm pretty balanced. I'll tell you, 
exactly what I think of things. I don't have any affiliations with with any hardware companies uh, for this reason. Uh, my only sort of sponsor on this channel at the moment are sort of software and and uh, service like DistroKid. Uh, but yeah, I don't have any direct affiliations with hardware companies. I've never done a review for pay uh, for a piece of hardware, including of course Apple. And the reason I do that is that I just want to make sure that I'm giving the full details here. So yes, you're going to pay more. And the reason that I was a PC user for 25 years was that I looked at the price tag of a PC, I looked at a relative price tag for a Mac, and it was always double. And I just thought to myself, A, I've got the learning curve of going from PC to Mac, and B, I'm spending twice as much coin. Yeah, forget about it. What Apple did that was super smart is that they made Mac OS uh, almost identical to iOS. So as soon as that Mac OS version, the, the um, Catalina, no, yeah, uh, came out, and I saw that it was basically just like a, a, a slightly beefed up version of iOS now with all the same features and all the same things. The, the learning curve was less steep. And then at the same time, they threw a Mac Mini that was like less than $1,000 in my face and went, here, have this. It's a system on a chip. It runs just as fast as the same priced PC. And I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I'm going to give it a try. And uh, from then on... Yeah, it's been all about the Mac. Uh, I, I thought I'd just try the Mac and then I'd go back to uh, to the PC. The PC's gathering dust, my friends. Uh, and that's just the way it is. That's just the reality. And again, I say this because not because I'm a professional reviewer, but I am, I am. I, this is my job to, to actually create content and to create music and to create videos and do live streaming. And all of that is made much easier with the Mac M1 and the infrastructure that, that I have in place now. So that's all I got to say about that. Uh, last but not least in the news and notes section, before I get too carried away here, is that we got something pretty darn exciting coming up here on the channel. Uh, this is, of course, episode 98 of GarageBand Weekly, and in two weeks' time, we have this one here, GarageBand Weekly, episode 100 is hitting the airwaves, and uh, what we've got in store for you is going to be, uh, don't tell anyone, this is top secret information, but I've got two amazing GarageBand creators, we have Patrick from the Garage Band Guide, and we have the one and only Mr. Dan Baker, and we'll be doing a roundtable discussion. We're going to talk about the past, the present, and the future. So it's going to be a heap of fun. We're going to talk about our history and backgrounds with Garage Band, why we got into it, how we used it in the past, what we've done in the past. What do we do now? Is GarageBand still our go-to? Well, yeah, for, for, for myself and Patrick, definitely. Dan Baker, I know he uses a lot of other stuff. And then what's the future going to be like? Will we see Logic on iOS? Will GarageBand get that update to version 3 that everyone's been champing at the bit to get? And yes, it is champing, not chomping, even though I used to say chomping all the time. We will see that. So uh, that is in just two weeks' time. It's at a special earlier time. So we're going to be three hours earlier that day uh, because both uh, Patrick and Dan are in the UK. Uh, so it should mean that everyone around the world gets an opportunity, except our poor friends here in Australia. You want to set your alarm and get up because it'll be 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Uh, yeah, Mark, was, was my first Mac as well. I think for a lot of people, it was their first Mac. Uh, and Thomas Christ uh, started in uh, High Sierra and it was already pretty iOS, yeah. So I think a lot of people, a lot of the things that Apple have done, again, by lowering their prices, by giving you that lower point of entry and lower barrier of entry, and then because a lot of us that were, un there was heaps of people just like me. We were absolute iOS devotees. Like I've been using iPhones since the iPhone 4. So basically, the third, it took me three versions. I was back using like Nokia smartphones and Palm Trios for a while. And then I finally went, yeah, you know what? I was using an iPod Touch and a Palm Trio. The iPhone was just smooshing those two things together. So why not get an iPhone? So that's where I went with that. So uh, exciting things, exciting times are coming up here in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, once again, if you are just joining us live, uh, all you need to do if you have a question about anything GarageBand related or Macs or iPhones or iPads or iPod Touches or the music creation in general, now is your time because uh, we are here and we are ready <clears throat> to chat and answer any of your questions. So do throw them here in the chat. Have I got? No, no, my coffee's gone. We're going to have to go water instead of coffee, which is probably a good idea here. It is springtime here in Australia, and my goodness, is it like pollony out there? I walked the walked the children to school and got back, and I was like, oh, oh quick, antihistamine, <laughs> get that tell fast into me. Uh, so apologies if I'm a bit more nasally than usual. Uh, let's say good day to the folks who are here live, and then we'll jump in with a bit of a rant, shall we? Uh, we've said hello to uh, Thomas Christ. Hello, Dave Fox is in the house. Joe Glenn, welcome to you. Mark Bro Valium FM, hello to you. Hello, Bear. There is a bear in there. Sion's here. G'day. 
day to you. Uh, Gregory O'Sullivan, who we talked uh, about before with your comment. Jalen Lay, uh, hello to all and sundry. I hope you are doing well. Uh, question, what would you recommend for making a website? Yeah, really good question. I am the worst person to ask for this because if you've been over to studiolivetoday.com, uh, you'll realize that whilst it is a functional website, it is a far from optimized website. So I actually use, and this is probably a good tip for those starting out. If you want to get started for free and easily, I use wordpress.com. So wordpress.com, so you'll see at the top there that I literally use the free version of wordpress.com. So studiolivetoday.wordpress.com press.com is where this page is actually hosted. I just also bought a domain. So I've got studiolivetoday.com, which literally just redirects you straight in to this free WordPress site. Is it ideal? No. Does it work? Yes. So that's where I get started. Uh, WordPress itself is better, uh, but a steeper learning curve and harder to set up. So you have to actually know what you're doing and have a host and have servers and things like that, which I don't have the time or the energy to do. I've heard a lot of people say good things about Wix, uh, which is a very simple sort of point and click kind of editor and Squarespace. If you listen to any podcast around the world, you would have heard Squarespace. Uh, and I have tried uh, creating some Squarespace websites. They do work pretty well. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's really down to how much effort you want to put into it. So for me, um, I think the absolute lowest point of entry is just go to wordpress.com, sign up for your account, it's free, and then uh, get yourself a domain. I use hover.com for my domains. There's links down in the description to hover.com, which is my referral link if you do want to check it out, an affiliate link. And then, uh, yeah, just get yourself, get yourself sion.com and then set up sion.wordpress.com and for like 20 bucks, you can, for $20 a year, just as cost of your domain name, you can be out of the gates and uh, good to go. Uh, a question from G Black is GarageBand for Mac is just as good as Beatmaker 3. Now, here's, here's the thing, and I'll, I'll get a bit ranty before we go on another rant. Uh, but yeah, is it as good as? Uh, I, I think using a subjective and ob objective terms like good, better, best, it really is. It's totally subjective because it depends on your workflow. If you're using Beatmaker 3 and you love the workflow of Beatmaker 3 and you, you're making good music, keep using Beatmaker 3. And it's the same that I say with other people when people are like, oh, Pete, I can't believe you use GarageBand. I use Logic. I use Reaper. I use Final Cut. Final Cut? Who's making music in Final Cut? I use Pro Tools. Uh, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what you use. But I know that a lot of people use multiple. So a lot of people will create their initial beat in something like Beatmaker, then fly it over, export it over into GarageBand because GarageBand has better mixing, mastering, and real instrument tools. Uh, and the same thing with other people. There's a lot of people that use a hybrid of different types of uh, interface, not interfaces, different types of DAWs, different types of apps, different types of software. So yeah, it's a big fat it depends, which I know is never a good way, but um, I think Sion says it well here. GarageBand is a linear door with Live Loot's method of production. So uh, if you're using, if you're used to something like Beatmaker or Ableton that is more of a fluid beat and loop style of production, the workflow is going to be very different unless you're using Live Loops in GarageBand. Uh, but if you're like me and you come from a, like a, a tracking day where everything is just on a track and everything is linear, then I actually get super confused using things like Beatmaker. The few times I've tried Beatmaker, I just, um, I open it up and I look around and I get really uh, overwhelmed and I close it again. So it's uh, it's up to you, uh, but it is great. Uh, question from Bear is, GB free on Mac? It sure is. It is uh, one of the selling points of the Mac platform is that every single Mac comes with that little garage band uh, already installed, ready to use. Garage band and iMovie, like that's the thing. And this is where, like my kids, uh, they're, they're pretty lucky that they're probably that their dad's probably going to overspend on their first computers because at the moment they're, they're using my old hand-me-down PCs. But when they hit high school and when they need their own computer for their own creative productivity, it's going to be a Mac because it's going to come with iMovie and it's going to come with GarageBand. And creating audio and video, audio visual content, yeah, writing is still important. Let's not underplay the fact that you still need to know how to write and communicate in the written language is still a very cool thing. But audio and video is probably about three to four times more important than it was 10 years ago. Do you think that's a fair comment? That people these days, sharing ideas and sharing concepts is done so... Think about the boom in podcasting. Think about all of the voice devices in your home. Your A word, your G word, I won't say them, your S word. Because if I say them, your devices are all going to start going, what would you like me to do today? Um, think about that. And then think about the explosion of YouTube and Twitch and TikTok, 
All of these things are leading to the fact that so many industry, and I don't care where you are, like I used to work for an energy company. They had a whole department devoted to creative work to the point where at one stage I could, I, I kind of said I was creating some videos and I got an Adobe license on my on my PC. So I had uh, Premiere Pro and uh, Audition on there, which was kind of cool. I, I, I was actually doing videos, but I think I had like one project to do and then they forgot to take it away from me. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of cool. Uh, all righty. Uh, yes, yes, Bear is getting his first own laptop and I had Logic installed too. Yeah, so Logic uh, is the big brother of GarageBand or big sister, big cousin, big uncle uh, of GarageBand and uh, that does cost. So that's $199 if you're in the US, $299 here in Australia. And you can get it pre-installed uh, or you can just download it and you can get a 90-day free trial, which is what I'm doing right now. And uh, I will be actually looking at Logic Pro. I kind of buried the lead. I'll be looking at Logic Pro both on my Mac Mini M1 here, uh, but I'll also be checking it out on, uh, on this puppy which is the the macbook pro uh so this is probably a good segue to to lead into the next uh, the next section here which is going to be which mac should i choose there are so many options when it comes to buying a new mac and if you are a garage band producer or a music and video producer here in 2021 what do you go for what do you pick how do you decide well, here's, here's what we're going to break down. If I go, jump over here to apple.com, there are a few things that you can do here. So if we're here and we go to Mac, this is what you're faced with. And this is a decision that a lot of people have, which is um, your MacBook Air, your MacBook Pro, your iMac, your Mac Pro, and your Mac Mini. You do have a comparison uh, thing here and you can shop for them. So let's hit the comparison. This is always a good thing to do. We'll have a quick drink here. So let's go through a couple of different types and a couple of options that you would have. And we're assuming you're buying a new Mac here at the moment. You can, of course, buy a secondhand Mac. The biggest difference at the moment between Macs is that some of them are using the old Intel chips and the newer ones are using the new Mac M1 chip. What is the difference? Well, the Intel chips are made by Intel. They have separate CPU and GPU and memory. So everything's like the old way of doing things. Everything works together separately, separate hard drives, all component based, if you consider it that way. The new Mac M1 is a system on a chip, an SOC, which means everything is on the one chip. Yes, it means that upgradability is virtually zero, but it gives you so many different efficiency, power consumption, and just better power management overall than having all those separate components. And it's also, like in all the testing and in my work and everything that I've seen, uh, it, it doesn't heat up as much. So some of the older Macs uh, and some of the Intel-based Macs, especially the more powerful ones, like you turn them on, it sounds like it's an aircraft about to take off. Uh, so you don't have that as much with the M1s because the power management, it's all built in. Apple own every part of that architecture and they can actually optimize it for performance. So let's take a look. If you are wanting to go, what is the cheapest that you could actually buy right now? And it would probably be this one, the one that they actually sell here, which is the, the old MacBook Air 2017. Well, no, it's actually not available anymore. So they don't actually sell it. So there you go. You can't buy that one. So all of the MacBook Airs now that you can buy are indeed, oh, no, we can still get the 2020. No, they're, they're not available to buy. So they've stopped selling all of the Intel-based Mac book airs the macbook pros now that they've got the new ones in there they've done the same thing because even if we go back to here you can see they're not available so we can compare them but you can see here that they use the intel core i9 up to the i9 processors they've got like the separate radeon gpu the difference here with the apple m1 is that everything's built in so everything is on that M1 Pro or Max or original M1 chip. So that's what you're looking at there. So if you are actually looking for this, if you're wanting to go a notebook, your options at this point are the MacBook Air M1 is going to be your cheapest option from $9.99 there. Your middle option is the 13-inch MacBook Pro from 2020. This is using the M1 chip, so this is going to be a little bit of a beefed up, same chip, but just some slightly beefed up options. And then if you want to go all out, you want to go the 14 or the 16-inch. Now, they're basically the same with just a different display. 14-inch has a 14.2-inch display. The 16-inch has a 16.2-inch display. All the other bits and pieces in side are almost identical the 16 inch has one feature that the 14 inch doesn't which is that you can because it's got slightly larger fans in there you can say just go power it's got this full power mode where it won't throttle your power at all 
Would many people need that? Probably not. So let's go the 14 inch here. You can see the price comparison there that you're going to go from $9.99 to $12.99 to $19.99. Now, will the MacBook Air here, the cheapest, the $1,000, will this run GarageBand and run it well? Yeah, it will. Uh, how would I configure one of these? Well, I would actually up a few things in here. So we're going to go in and buy one in a sec. The same with the, the Mac 13-inch uh, MacBook Pro. It has basically the same stuff here. Look at this. It's almost identical all the way down here. Slightly better battery life. And it's got Touch ID and the Touch Bar on there, which they removed on the latest MacBook Pro. So that tells you something about whether the Touch Bar is particularly useful. So <laughs> I wouldn't go the MacBook Pro. I would, I would eliminate this one from your thinking because you might as well go the air as opposed to the slimmed down pro and then of course you got this one so let's pretend we wanted to get in for the cheapest possible laptop for a mac we would jump in here we're going to go this now you've got two options here and what you'll see is the only difference with this is it's got an eight core cpu and a seven core gpu this one's got an eight core gpu and an eight core gpu the reason that this one exists is that what they do is they test all the different cores and then if there's any that are not and it's not that they're faulty as such but if they're just not if they don't past the quality control testing, which is quite stringent, then they just disable one of those cores and sell them cheaper. So in terms of someone creating music, does the difference between a seven core or an eight core GPU matter? No, not really. But you can see here that if you get the eight core one, you also get five, 12 gigabytes of storage, which as someone who got 256, I would recommend <laughs> because especially if you're considering using Logic Pro on a laptop and having a whole bunch of samples and a whole bunch of loops and a whole bunch of projects, yeah, you can use external storage and your iCloud storage, but having a bit more on board would probably help you out. So I would probably go with that one because you're paying the you know 250 more, but you're getting the eight gig of RAM, 512 SSD, and you're paying $1,250 uh, US, which is about $2,000 here in Australia. Now, is $2,000 a cheap laptop? Well, it's all depending on your, your perspective. If this is going to be your laptop for the next five years, that's a pretty good investment. If it's going to help you create all your video and all your audio, it's a pretty good investment in my humble opinion. So if we came in here and we selected this one, uh, you can get these pretty quickly now within just a few days and you can come in here and customize it. If you did want to beef up your memory to give yourself even more future proofing, you can do that up to the 16 gigabytes. You can add up to a terabyte or two terabytes of storage. So yeah, probably one terabyte if you wanted to really beef it up. And there you go, like around $1,650 for that laptop. If you went the other direction, so if we go back, if we go back to our original choice here uh, and back again, if you wanted to go to the 14 inch, what is your price difference here? Well, again, from 1999, let's come in here and buy one of these. So you do get a much better display. You do get the little notch in the top. So consider that if that's something that you want there. And again, you've got the two different types. This time you've got an eight and 14 core and a 10 and 16 core. So you get a lot beefier processing and power here, but you do get your 16 gigabytes of your of unified memory and 512 of SSD. So again, if you wanted to really future-proof yourself, I think this is a pretty good deal here to have all of that, to have the 16 gig of memory, that 512, because remember, it, it was going to cost us about uh, you know $1,300 or up to 1400 to get all those specs there. This is actually a pretty good buy here, the 14-inch uh, MacBook Pro in either the silver or the space gray. So, uh, and again, you can, you can max it out to your heart's content here. You can go all the way up to 64 gigabytes, the max processor there, up to eight terabytes of storage, and uh, you can end up spending yourself quite a pretty penny there, getting up to about 5,800. So you probably don't need to go that far. Now, what about a desktop? You might be saying, Pete, I want a desktop. I don't want a laptop. I want something that's just going to sit here. Well, there's a couple of options here. You've got the iMac. And these have been updated with the new 24-inch that has the, the, the same specs as a MacBook Air, basically. Consider this a MacBook Air, but in desktop form. So all the same things I said about the MacBook Air uh, apply. They still have the 27-inch iMac. This is using the old Intel chip. Would I recommend it right now in 2021? No, I think you can just completely uh, look past that. And what we're expecting is that later this year or more likely next year, we're going to get some new larger IMAX. But at the moment, probably not an option. The, the real one that's the powerhouse that everyone, I know Mark bought one, Thomas bought one, Jay bought one, I bought one, is the Mac Mini. And I think that the Mac Mini, if you don't want a laptop, if you're not going to be portable, if you've got a home studio and you want a box to just run all your stuff, 
I actually think the Mac Mini is your best buy for a Mac right now. It's what I bought, it's what I use, it's what I'm using right now, and it does the job in a big bad way. So what, what do we have within the Mac Mini? Let's go over to the buy page to see what we're going to get. Uh, Sion says he also bought a Mac Mini. Yeah, a lot of people are jumping on the Mac Mini bandwagon. So you've got the same sort of things here. And the only difference between this one and this one this time around, you don't have that seven core, so it's all the same processor. It's just the difference between the 256 storage and the 512 storage. The other advantages you get with this is you get Ethernet on board, which you don't get on any of the laptops. So if you want that wired connection, if you're doing live streaming like I'm doing here and you don't want to live the dongle life, that is a good thing. And you get actual USB-A ports. So for those of us with older gear, I've got a USB-A hub and all my USB, like my Zoom Live Track and my Scarlet interface, my mouse, my keyboard, all my USB stuff can plug straight into this thing. And uh, it, it, uh, it does a good job with that. So if you wanted to get the absolute base model, it is in stock. It is shipping right now. Now, the memory. I got the 8 gigabytes. In hindsight, would I have paid a little extra and should I have got the 16? Probably. So if you're running GarageBand and you're using a whole bunch of external apps and you're using third-party apps and you're using instruments and you're using plugins and you're really pushing it hard, or especially if you're using Logic and you're using like a whole bunch of cinematic instruments and a whole bunch of tw tweaking a whole bunch of settings, 16 gig is going to give you a bit more overhead. Now, that being said, has the 8 gig ever really let me down on anything I do? No, but none of my projects are more than about 32 tracks and I don't use a whole lot of external plugins. So that's the one thing to consider there. The other is storage. Now, again, I went the absolute base level of storage and it's the one thing that I probably regret more than anything. When, if and when I update my Mac for my studio here, it will be at least 512, probably one terabyte of storage. So I think for, for longevity, having that little bit of extra storage space can really help, especially if you're installing GarageBand and all the different sound libraries and packs, and especially if you're using Logic or Final Cut Pro or anything like that. They have a lot of stuff that they install. Now, one of the things I've done is I've actually installed the sound library from Logic to my external hard drive. It seems to have caused a few problems in terms of speed and reliability. I don't know if it's directly related to that. I need to do more testing, but yeah, it, it is worth doing that. So my my recommendation right now, so the voice is going, I've had a big weekend, to, not of partying, but of, uh, of, of shows. So my recommendation on a Mac right now would basically be the Mac Mini M1 with 16 gig of RAM and probably 5, 12 gigabytes of storage, you're going to get away for just under $1,100 and you're going to have yourself a powerhouse little machine that is going to run GarageBand absolutely beautifully. Now, if you compare that to buying a second-hand Mac, this is why the Mac Mini is so good at this price because previously you are probably paying $1,500, $2,000 for that same sort of power and then at that point you're like, well, maybe I get a PC or maybe I get myself a second-hand one. I think at this point having those options is really really good uh so uh, mark says it, it's related to your hard drive uh you need ssd i did it without any problems yeah and that's probably it i'm using an older not an older but i'm using a spinning hard drive and i think because it has to spin up every time it's accessing the library i'm starting to get a few beach balls that's the only thing that uh, that i think is a problem with that uh Jaylen says i would like to uh, see as a future upgrade to the mobile version of gb integration with native instruments contact yeah i mean there's a lot of things we'd like to see in garage band uh, i don't know that uh, the mobile version is going to get not that it won't get any love. We'll talk about this in two weeks' time with, with Dan and Patrick, but I think it's it's not prone for, for getting a whole lot of love in terms of additional stuff. Uh, yes, I know. I need to lose the spinning rust. I need to... It's fine. Look, spinning drives are fine for data, for pure data, like for backup and for storage. But anytime you're accessing data, a spinning drive is not your friend. And I, I didn't really... I bought that drive not really thinking about that. So there's two things that I need to buy <laughs> probably today or very soon. One is a... a a Thunderbolt hub because I need to test out the MacBook Pro and that has Thunderbolt ports. And then I need to buy, yeah, I need to actually buy a Thunderbolt SSD drive. So uh, if anyone wants to donate to the channel or wants to uh, buy my GarageBand course or uh, or become a patron, that all helps. Speaking of my patrons, uh, I was trying to use, I did get, I got an extension cable for my in-ear monitor headphones and I was trying to get them. I just couldn't get them in comfortably before the show today, but I will be testing those out throughout today and I will be doing some more, uh, some more shooting and filming shortly uh, so shout out to my patrons I will uh, send out a link because uh, you'll be able to join me as I do a little bit of testing uh, this morning and start shooting a couple of videos getting ready for that because I will have later in the week my full review here's the thing 
I did. I, I was going to be a Renee Ritchie when when the because. Just to, to get you up to speed, uh, Apple let me borrow this for two weeks. So I've got this for another week and a half, and I'm using it as I'm, I'm going to convert to using this as my daily driver. So the, the MacBook Pro, the, the challenge here is that it's got slightly different port layout, doesn't have any USB-A ports. So I just need to work out what different adapters and dongles that I need to get this working to replace my Mac M1. And then I'll be able to uh, test it out to do exactly what I do to creating GarageBand, to create Logic, to, uh, to do my live streams to, to share my GarageBand iOS projects and screens and do everything with that. And then I'll give you my, my impression. If you want my hot take first impression on this right now, yeah, it, it absolutely flies along. Like it, There is zero delay between doing anything. And it is actually very nice to live in a world where you don't have to wait on anything. So I'm now, <laughs> what I'm realizing is, you know how sometimes you do something on a computer or on a device and you're waiting for it? Now it's waiting for me. It's, it's almost putting pressure on me to say, oh, now, now I'm the bottleneck. Now I'm the one that's holding up the computer. The computer's like, yeah, I'm ready for your next thing now, buddy. And I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that yet. So uh, yeah. So in terms of some of the things that are controversial, uh, do I hate the notch? No, I don't really care about the notch. I love the fact that I can log in with my finger. So it's got touch ID right here on the keyboard. So that really helps. Hang on, I'll just close my, uh, close my browser. Uh, now I've got a I've got a black screen as my background here, so you can't even really see the notch. But th and that's probably the good thing. It's when you're watching something or you're using a full screen app. In fact, let's just uh, I'll just fire up GarageBand here, so you can see what it looks like. We'll load GarageBand. It'll take about three seconds to to be on my screen. <laughs> it's, take, it's taking longer to download the actual file. Uh, boom, boom, boom. So there you go. So you can see when you when you're in something like GarageBand, then it. The notch is just up there in your top menu bar, so it completely disappears. So the actual notch is not a problem in my view. Uh, you know what I've just realized? I've still got my green screen on here. Good thing I'm not wearing anything green. Uh, let's turn that off. There we go. <laughs> I could just see a weird thing, a weird artifact here on the on the green of the garage band. I'm like, oh yeah, I've got my green screen on. That's a bit weird. Um, so yeah, so it, it works really well. Uh, it flies along. So the notch is good. The, the reader there is good. Uh, the ports. So yeah, you've got three Thunderbolt ports and you've got HDMI, which is going to be handy for me to be able to put it out to a larger screen, which is what I want to do. The trackpad's actually awesome. It's a really large trackpad and it makes it easier for navigating around in something like GarageBand because one of the problems I have here in GarageBand is that I'm used to a touch screen so I keep trying to reach for the screen but here with this you can actually use the trackpad as you zoom in and out and which makes life a lot easier and to move up and down to scroll up scroll down and scroll left and right so I think I need to I think I've convinced myself I need to buy a magic trackpad for my my desktop because this is just super handy um, outside of that yeah, the screen is magnificent. So I, for the first day, I was supposed to be, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll test this out, I'll play with it. And I just basically went onto like YouTube and watched a whole bunch of 4K video and, and onto um, Apple TV and watching some shows and movies. And it is spectacular. Uh, sound wise, the, the audio quality, I'll be testing that out again. So again, if you're a patron, I'm going to do a live stream test using the Mac M1's built-in mic and the, the speakers. The speakers are really, really good. There's six speakers. There's like two woofers and, and uh, four tweeters, and it sounds really good. The, they call it studio quality microphone. It's not like this sort of studio quality microphone, but for a laptop, it's pretty solid. And the webcam's the upgraded 1080p webcam, so it, it's pretty good. There's a lot of a lot of goods about it. That was a longer rant than I uh, meant to do because we're now 37 minutes in. We're going to be here. Uh, alert the affiliates, folks, because we're going to go into overtime here today. Uh, but if you did have any questions, again, uh, and you're looking to to get a new uh, new Mac or a new iPhone or a new new device, uh, do let me know. Do ask the questions. And if you're looking for an iPhone or iPad, I've got guides over on my website at studiolivetoday.com. All right. Let's move to our next section. We're going to get back over to iOS. We've been talking a lot of Mac in the last two weeks because it's been the new hotness. Uh, but I wanted to jump into iOS and play around with a few things here today. So uh, GarageBand iOS, are you ready? Are you ready to accept uh, the challenge? Yes, I am, Pete. Here I am. So we're going to play around with GarageBand iOS. Let me just test. Uh, we've now got the picture in picture here. For That's actually not bad. Are we going to lose much of the screen if I do this? Let's just jump in here. Uh, what I can do is we can shimmy this across and that way you can get more of that goodness of the GarageBand iOS. There you go. See stream, I'm, I'm, between, I'm between StreamYard and Restream at the moment. I'm testing out which one I go with. Let's just do a quick sound test here. Sounding good. 
Very cool. Uh, does anyone buy additional warranty? Uh, I don't, Randy. I have started getting more Apple Care on my stuff, but um, I, I don't usually go the anything extended. I tend to find that everything works pretty reliable, reliably as it is. All right. Uh, so, where, what, what is first on my list here? Ah, yes, our plugin or app of the week. So, plugin or app of the week. We're looking at a brand new piano app. Now, you may be aware that there is the Grand Piano AUV3. It's a very cool app. It's like $2 and you can buy it on the App Store. The one we're looking at here today is a new version of that. It's version 2. It's a $4.99 app and uh, I've not used it before. So you and I are going to use it together here for the first time on the show, which is always exciting slash dangerous. <laughs> So what we'll do is we'll come in here to an external instrument here in GarageBand. We're going to grab this one, the Grand Piano AUV3. And the first thing you're going to see here, and when I saw the screenshots of this, is we got a whole lot of control over this, yeah? So we've got a bunch of them. We've got all these different presets and user banks that we can use up here. Uh, we've got, uh, I'm just clicking around here. We've got the ability to change things. No. <laughs> but we have a piano. Now, I actually kind of dig the original piano in GarageBand. When I want a really high-end piano, I use Clev Grand's, um, no, not Clev Grand, I use a Ravenscroft 275, uh, which is one that our, my friend Thomas Galane put me onto a long time ago. But if you want a piano that's somewhere in between, that's not going to cost you the $30, $40 for, for Ravenscroft, but is also probably a little more customizable or a lot more customizable than the original GarageBand piano, this looks like a pretty good option. So let's uh, come in here. That's pretty nice. And we've got a bunch of different things that we can play around here with. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to create a little bit of a song here because it's Halloween. I'm going to create a bit of a creepy song. So what do we need for a creepy song? Well, we need a creepy, uh, creepy key signature. So we're going to go A minor. Why? Because A minor has the most white notes and Pete's not very good at piano, especially when I'm reaching over and playing on a touch screen. So we're going to bring it into A minor here so that we're going to have some consistency here. Let's um let's get our tempo. So we're going to do do, 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 do. We want a little sort of creepy, jaunty song. So we're going to go 60, uh, 76 on the uh, the time signature there, on the, the tempo. And... Let's do a bit of this, shall we? So we'll record this in. Now, it's an AUV3 plugin, meaning that we can actually use it here right within GarageBand, and it will record it as MIDI, which makes it super handy. So let's hit the record button and see how Pete goes recording in here. All right, we'll go with that for now. Let's see what that performance was like. We'll come back out here to our track view, and you can see if you've not used an external instrument here, it looks just like a regular keyboard. So if we come here, in fact, we'll do some direct comparisons, shall we? This is always fun. So we'll grab keyboard, and we'll go directly in here to the regular piano by going keyboards, and then so many pianos in here. We'll go with the, uh, the classical grand from GarageBand. So you can hear there that it's... It's a different tone straight off the bat. So it's a softer kind of tone on that original one. And when we play the grand piano here, it's more of a, uh, yeah, more, more sort of reverberant tone there. So if we come in here, we can actually change the settings that we had after we've actually put that in. So let's come in here and start playing with some of these dials, shall we? So first of all, we've got a volume dial here. So we could just turn the volume up or down. And then we've got our attack uh, a, D, S, R, attack, delay, decay, sustain, and release. So on a piano, you normally want the attack right up the top there. We can add a bit more sustain here. So that gives the notes a little bit more of that sustain -y feel there. We've then got a tremolo. We can change the rate here and then the depth. Well, that could be kind of cool. For our creepiness, we've got a stereo widener here. Oh, hello. If you're listening on headphones, you just heard that go super wide. So there's it in the middle, and then we'll go wide. Oh, it puts it out to the edges. Yeah, nice. So let's come in here. We've got tuning. Now, Thomas has just noticed this, and I've noticed it as well. Uh, tuning is interesting. So this one, oh, look at that. 
We can go by number of cents. <gasps> this is going to really impress the uh, the 432 hertz crowd because you could technically... Now, I can't remember exactly how many you have to go down uh, of the semitone, but if we listen to this, like we'll, we'll adjust the tuning. We'll play it and we'll adjust the tuning as we go. <laughs> so that's minus 100 cents, which is a whole semitone. So you can hear there that it's... So you can actually take it down just a few cents, which I think... Uh, what is it? 440 to uh, 432. It is eight cents, I think, that you go down. Oh, can you can you dial it in? Can we just tap it there? If there's a way... I'm not sure if there's a way to actually just tap and dial in the exact number you want. That's usually the problem with these sort of things. If there is, I apologise. If someone's used this and they know that you can, let me know. But it looks like there would be a way there to tune it, which can be handy. Like if you're playing along to something and you want to tune it, uh, you want to tune the notes. Can we double tap? Yeah, double tap back to zero is always good there. Uh, we've got some auto pan here, which is pretty interesting. So let's play around with this. Where's our rate? Here's our depth. Oh, there you go. You got a bit of that. Auto pan. Very cool. And then we've got uh, a filter here. So we can adjust our frequency, our Q setting, and then our mix here. So that's pretty cool. There you go. You can, you can filter it there. And then you get that more sort of subtle sound. A little bit more like that. I don't love that auto pan. I'm going to turn that off again. There we go. So you can hear how, see how it's a bit harsh there. We could add this filter. And then you go back there. So if we come back in here and we compare this again. So the beauty part about doing this with an AUV3 is we can then copy this one. And uh, if we paste it down here in the original piano, uh, you can see here. Now in the original piano, of course, you can use all of your different plugins and EQs and effects. But you can do the same thing on this one. You can still add compression and all your other effects that you want to to your AUV3. But you get that control inside the instrument as well. Whereas when you come to the regular classical grand, you don't have that control. So uh, here is the original original classical grand. Let's take a listen. And then let's take a listen to the uh, the grand piano AUV3. Different kind of sound, isn't it? But you can definitely come in here and uh, and adjust it and change it to your heart's content, which is pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, look, it's a, it's a basic, simple piano sound, but having that amount of control uh, is really, really cool. Now, I'm not sure if there are actually presets. Let's see if there's any included presets. I don't, I can't see a, a way to, to change that. So there's our sounds. Uh, we can save in a user preset like so, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe uh, Jay was saying that she's uh, looking at this at the moment. So uh, maybe there is a way to cancel that. Maybe there is a way to, to use some presets, but uh, I don't know. I think it's good. I think it's a gateway between that, between something like a, a, Clev, a, a Ravenscroft uh, 275. And if you've just, you know, you don't want to spend that 30 bucks, but you want a more, uh, more flexible piano sound that you can actually play around with a bunch of stuff, then you can use this. We have a chorus here as well. I didn't even play with this. Chorus is always cool. <laughs> Let's try this. Oh, wow. <laughs> we might leave the chorus off there, but yeah, you got chorus sound if you want there. And then we got reverb, so we can go with like the size of your reverb. And then let's add some big reverb to this mix. Oh, wow. So that's actually not a bad sound. That's not a bad sound for um for this. So we're working on this creepy song. And again, the other advantage over using something that's going to record it in as, a, um, as an audio trying to get the words, interapp audio, is that we can adjust this. So if we wanted to change, so I'm like, oh, that's a bit slow. We actually want this to be up at maybe around uh, 90 BPM. We change that and then it can actually change it. So everything changes for you which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, for those asking, uh, thank you, Jade, who's put the link there. There is a link down in the description of this video to where you can go and pick it up. Uh, it is called Grand Piano AUV3 number two. 
It is it is exactly what it says it is. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Like, I don't review a lot of apps. I leave that to, to Doug at the sound test room. I leave that to Jade on how to app on iOS. But uh, yeah, the developer reached out to me and just said, hey, you want to check this out? And I said, yeah, sure. So yeah, full disclosure, I was given a copy of this for review purposes. And uh, it's probably a piano that I'm going to throw in. It seems to be pretty good on resources, pretty lightweight. I'm sure Jade will dive in and, and work out a whole bunch more about that. Uh, but yeah, just a handy piano app to have here. So uh, let's uh, let's just loop this out. We'll make this section uh, 16 bars, not, not 116, but 16 bars. And uh, there you go. We'll just have this nice... Nice creepy piano sound playing these chords all the way through. And of course, if you're not happy with your play, you can use things like quantization. We can come in here to quantization and we can put a little quantization on here. Just 16th note, just to tidy it up a bit. So it's going to hit right on those notes. Pretty cool. I'm down with it. I'm down with the Grand Piano AUV3. So go check out the link in the description and check it out. Very cool. Uh, sounds good, uh, but very compressed. Well, so yeah, so uh, it's it's about a 500 megabyte uh, file. So it's got some decent piano samples in there. Uh, and obviously something like Ravenscroft that's bigger and uh, has sort of slightly higher quality samples. But you're paying what six times as much, so yeah, it's it's all down to what you what you need in a in a AUV three. So uh, that is an actual app of the week. <laughs> Haven't done an app of the week for a really long time. <laughs> all right, <clears throat> uh, let's jump into a, a tip of the week. If we don't have any other questions, I'll just uh, check check in this. Uh, the only question was, what is that called? So yes, it's a Grand Piano AUV three, and it seems to be pretty good. I don't, I don't mind it. Uh, cool. Let's, uh, can I put it? Yeah, so there's already a link in the chat there um, for for that particular app. And yeah, the developer seems like a really cool person. So uh, yeah, go for it. All righty. Uh, tip of the week. So GarageBand, using key signatures and editing chords is something that you may want to do if you're creating a song and you want to change things up. So to access your key signature, you go to your settings. I've got this little piano piece here that I've created already. You go to your settings here and we've got the key signature. Now I've set this to A minor. Why? Because A minor has the most white keys in it and I'm not a very good keyboard player. But if I wanted to change this, all I need to do is adjust it here. So I've already played this part in in A minor. But if I wanted to change this, I can actually change the, the keys that are already being played by changing this. So if I played it in a, a minor, but I actually wanted it in E flat minor, which is a key that I can't play in, I can actually change it right here. And now take a listen. Ooh, it's different. So that's kind of cool. Now, the other thing that changing your key signature does here in GarageBand is it changes the chords that you actually use when you're using an instrument. So what I've got here is I've got a piano sound as well here. It's using the same keys there, but let's just delete those and, and pretend we wanted to add in a different piano sound here to go along with this original piano sound. Well, what we can do is if we go into the instrument by clicking at the top here, that's going to take us into this view and... We can play our piano just using the keys there. But what if we want to use chords mode? Well, we can actually click this button or tap this button down in the bottom right, and it takes us into our chords view. And how cool is this? If you don't know how to play those E flat minor, and those B flat minor, and those A flat minor chords, you can actually play it right there. So you don't need to know anything about this. And if you've not used chords before, they're very cool. You've got got three bass notes there so you can tap one of them so let's so let's try and play along a bit of an accompaniment to this original one here with a with a full kind of piano chord here using our key signature Now, why did that sound terrible? Uh, mostly because I didn't have the, the uh, metronome on. So I didn't know what I was doing, so. Yeah, let's just do that. We'll do that same chord progression here. So we'll tap on here and we'll do. Now, 
Now, is that perfect? No, but you can see here how easy it is to just use your chord mode here. Now, what if you wanted to use a different chord in here where we can actually change up what chords are displayed here? So what you need to do is be in a chord mode, go up to your settings here, and this blue option here, now this is only here when you're in the chords mode. A lot of people want to change the chords, but if you're out here in your regular view and you go up to here, look at it, it goes away, it's not there. So you have to actually be in the chords mode and then go to the top here and then go edit chords. And now we can put all kinds of wacky chords. So the first thing you do is choose which chord you want to replace. So uh, let's just say I didn't want to use a D flat in this at all, but I wanted to use a variation on E flat minor. I wanted to do a slightly different sort of E flat minor. So what I'm going to do, because I'm going to grab E flat, we're going to grab minor, and let's say we wanted an E flat minor seventh, but with the bass note being a B flat. Uh, we can do that, and we can now create that funky looking chord there that I wouldn't know how to play on a keyboard, not a chance, but... Pretty cool. So uh, we, we get a different kind of sound there. And then if we wanted to uh, record that in this next section, does it quite go together? Maybe not, because we started with those other chords, but you can create yourself some really funky chords. And again, even stuff you don't know how to play, uh, and especially stuff you don't know how to play, you can do that. Now, what if we uh, we get all confused and we're like, actually, I want to go back to A minor. No problem, we can do that. Go back to A minor there. This will reset any of the default chords, but it will leave your custom chord there, but it actually will transpose it to the right key. Let's go with some uh, some, some jazz. <laughs> Freeform jazz <laughs> recital going on. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So you, your key signature here in GarageBand and your edit chords function are both very handy here if you're not a keyboard player, but you want to play some cool keyboard sounds. And don't forget, you can even use your autoplay here and your autoplay can be customized to these ones. So you can get yourself... And you've got four different settings here. And you've also got the ability to tap with multiple fingers. If you tap with two fingers, you get a different sound. And if you tap with three fingers, you get another sound. So it's very, very cool, very flexible, and a cool way to change up, especially if you are a non-keyboard player and you want to adjust your keys and your chords. So I hope you found that one a bit useful. I haven't, uh, I haven't done any of these sort of garage bandy uh, things for a while, and I get a lot of questions about that. So don't be surprised when that bit gets clipped out and released as another video this week, uh, because that's how we roll around here. Where are we at? We are at a um, we are at the fifty seven minute mark, and uh, what I was going to do here today is um, is do a little bit of a fun thing where I'm going to create a bit of a creepy song. I'm still going to do it, even though we're over time. So uh, for those that can hang out for another fifteen minutes, we're going to dive into this because I've created the original one. Let's just delete out this. We've got uh, our bases here for a creepy sound. Nice. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is let's dive in and create us a creepy song. So we've got a bass piano here. We've just got 16 bars and we're all built, built around this A minor. I'm going to leave it in A minor because uh, that's a key that I can actually play in. And one of the cool packs, the cool sound packs that I think is a little bit underused but works for creepy Halloweeny type songs is actually the toy box kit. So we're going to mess around with some toy box sounds here. Now, if you go to, here's a weird thing. You can't really go to your kits here. You can't go to each individual pack. But if you go to recently downloaded, even if you haven't recently downloaded it, you can actually just find all the things here. So there's something about toy instruments that, that sound super creepy. If we go with something like the, uh, the music box here, listen to this. right? This is going to be pretty creepy. Uh, in fact, what we'll do, we'll, we'll use the arpeggiator. We'll cheat a little bit here to make this a little bit quicker. So the arpeggiator is this button here. We turn that on, we hit the run button. And now if we tap on a, say, A minor chord down here, right? <laughs> pretty 
pretty cool. Uh, so let's uh, let's just see if we can record in a basic A minor arpeggio to go underneath this creepy little track here. We'll hit record. There you go. Uh, so it's a little bit sort of syncopated and off the beat, but I kind of like that sometimes when you have an arpeggio that doesn't exactly go in line with everything else you got. So let's uh, let's loop that one out and we'll go with a nice A minor arpeggio there. Now we need a, a bit of a bassier sort of instrument. So let's go back to our toy box. And what are we going to use for the bass sound? Well, why don't we go with uh, this simple bass under the synth bass and let's see what this is. Yeah, maybe something like that. We'll change up, uh, we'll give it a little bit more resonance here. Right, and we'll get the attack down here just so it hits right on. Well, that's a little bit too much attack there. And we'll leave the cutoff uh, a little bit higher as well. Is this gonna work with our sound? Maybe not, let's just try it. Do it. All right, it's not bad, uh, but it might need a little bit of tweaking on there. Or we can change the instrument afterwards. So we'll bring that to there. We will uh, flick it out and loop it up, and then we're gonna have something like this. We will need to quantize it because I missed that last note. So we'll just jump in here to our settings and we'll go to track settings. We'll go to quantization and we'll put this right on the eighth note because it's right on that beat and then there you go. Cool. So we're starting to work on something that's going to be a bit creepy. And now we can now add another instrument here. We'll go back to our toy box. And the mini uh, marimba is one that I really like in here. This is if you ever want a sort of skeleton sound, you can use something like this. So. <laughs> let's uh, let's try the arpeggio again, and uh, let's uh, let's just make it super nuts here. So we're going to go like, uh, should we use like a thirty second note arpeggio that like goes across four octaves, <laughs> and we'll make the note order go up and down. This could could go anywhere here. Let's jump out and try it. Oh, that's a nuts. All right, we need to go a bit lower. So we'll come down an octave here. Okay, I think that's going a little bit too insane. It's going too high up there. I kind of like where it's going, but let's bring it back to uh, up and down and uh, a 16th note here. So we'll go to there and come back to the start here. And let's just experiment. This is the fun thing about doing this sort of stuff. All right, we'll try something like that. Let's hit record. There you go, something a bit different. So we've got some mini marimba in there. Do, 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 do. And we'll, uh, we'll, do, we'll loop that one out. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're cheating a little bit here. Let's see if there's anything within the autoplay that's gonna work with this to create a bit of a melody here. While, while we're cheating, let's cheat well. Toy piano, how cool is this? I think this needs to do like a slow. This needs to do like a slow walking kind of thing here. So let's let's see if we can just play something in here. sounding nuts, isn't it? <laughs> we need some strings in here just to go brrr, to give it some sort of low end stuff. Now, I don't actually know if I played the right notes here. Um, so let's just solo these up because I don't think I did at all.
Yeah, let's use those. I think it's going to work in there. It's a little bit off, but then when you're doing something creepy like this, it, it can be a little bit off. So we'll just create that and we'll loop that out. This can go down a little bit. Let's start working on some uh, some panning here. So we need um, we need our two arpeggios to go left and right. So let's go uh, track pan left. And let's go pan this arpeggio to the right. Leave our bass in the middle and our toy piano can be in the middle. Is that panning? There we go. Uh, and we'll just move this so that everything's in the right spot. So... So I don't like the bass. I like the notes of the bass, but the bass sounds not quite right. So here's the cool thing again, because we're in GarageBand, we can just change things up. So you don't want that simple bass doing the bass. Uh, let's try something else. What about the uh, the Celesta doing the bass sound? Let's find if that's going to work. Back to start. Oh, that's a bit creepier, right? Oh, how's that sound? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's there's something wrong there, isn't there? What's doing that tonk sound? Is that the first one of this one? No. There is an off note in there, isn't there? That's all right. You get the idea. I kind of like it with just those things in there. Uh, let's go to our toy box again, and uh, we'll go with the melodica, because melodica is always... Let's try some autoplay. Uh, does melodica have autoplay uh, in the chords mode? Yeah, why not? Let's see what autoplay we're going to get with our melodica. Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Sorry for everyone's ears. That was a little bit intense. Uh, let's. Uh, we'll try a different one here. We'll do a... Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe we need to at least turn that down because that's uh, that's hurting my ears. That's hurting my delicate ears. Come back over to here. Uh, what about the... Uh, we'll just do the bass. That's not bad. Just that bass sound with a... Nur, nur, nur. Let's record that in, shall we? Hit the button. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I don't mind that at all. So you can see what we're doing here. It's 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 very easy to just build yourself out something that could be a little bit uh, a little bit awesome here. Uh, let's just bring all the instruments back in together. Uh, we'll put the we'll do a bit more panning here. We'll put the piano over to the left, and we'll put the melodica a little to the right. Let's just uh, again, you need you need lots of reverb. Let's just swim these all in some master reverb because reverb equals creepiness, right? And maybe some echo as well, but we'll just use we'll just use reverb for the sake of uh, bringing this all together, and then uh, we'll, we'll choose a master effect that's going to be a super large hauly, or maybe uh, we'll just go large hall. I was going to go moon dome, but that might get a bit nuts. So uh, let's see what in uh, the space of ten minutes we've been able to create here. Yeah, it's that first note on the piano, isn't it? That's the one that's wrong. So we'll just come in here. We'll just quickly fix that. So it's um over here. We'll just make that the make that an A. So it's just going to do its standard thing here. And again, if we want a little bit more uh, perfectionisticness here, we'll just quantize that one as well because it's not hitting the right sound. Cool? Yeah. I like it. 
I dig it. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope you experiment with this sort of thing because sometimes one of the cool things, I know Russ, our friend here, does this uh, a lot of the time as well, but it can be cool. If you've not played around with one of these packs for a while, just jump in here, go to your keyboard sounds, go to recently downloaded and just pick a pack. Doesn't matter which one it is. Grab the ultimate 808s, grab the backlight bounce, grab the boys noise pack, the alpha waves and just create something. So the toy box is good for Halloween and for scary, spooky kinds of sounds, uh, but you can use any of those packs and you can create yourself something cool get amongst it all right that is pretty much going to do it here for for today for this week's episode we have gone about 10 minutes over time uh but i hope you are well hello to gotium 85 happy halloween to you happy uh, uh, halloween gino turis as well uh whoever, whoever anyone else i haven't said good day to uh please uh, speak now or forever hold yourself in pieces <laughs> or something like that all right. Uh, the final thing I just wanted to mention here is that if you are looking to learn Garage, but if you're watching this and you're like, oh, that looked cool, but how did you do that thing where you, you change the things around and how do you adjust your instruments and how did you do all the other bits and pieces? Uh, you can actually jump over. I've lost my, I've lost my pages now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find my link. Uh, that's right. I'll just throw it up here. You can go to this link down here, studiolivetoday.com slash courses. You can check out my Garage Band Beginner's Guide, and uh, that has all of the information. It's five hours of curated content, all the stuff that you need to get started in Garage Band, whether you're on your iPhone or or your iPad, and it's all fully transcribed into three different languages and has a whole bunch of sections and ways for you to jump around and uh, get all of your GarageBand goodness on. So uh, I do thank me for supporting the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for being here. Um, yes, more, a whole bunch more coming this week. Some more GarageBand, some more Logic stuff, more on the MacBook Pro, more on a whole bunch of things here. And don't forget, in two weeks' time, GarageBand Weekly episode 100. 100. Yeah, okay. Episode 100. So uh, that's going to be super cool with our friends Dan Baker and Patrick from the Garage Band Guide. Until next time, please uh, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, keep creating. And I'll see you real soon on Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. See you later. Need an answer to your question? John, do you have a suggestion?